Greetings to all of you, my dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, and a warm welcome to all of you from your pastor, Yeti. We start now in part two of Courage for the Conflict, the study of 2 Corinthians. And today we're going to talk about he was sure of ultimate victory, how God would be glorified, and so on. So he was sure, Paul was sure of ultimate victory. If Jesus Christ has conquered death, the last enemy, then why fear anything else? Men do everything they can to penetrate the meaning of that and prepare for it. Yet, the world has no answer to death. Until a person is prepared to die, he is not really prepared to live. The joyful message of the early church was the victory of Christ over death. And we need to return to that victorious emphasis. Note too that Paul saw a future renewing of God's people when he wrote, and all shall present, or all shall present us with you. So I say that again, know too that Paul saw a future reunion of God's people when he wrote, and shall present us with you. That is the great divider. But in Jesus Christ, there is an assurance that his people shall be renew- reunited in his presence. You can read that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the verses 13 to 18. A step further. He was sure God would be glorified. This verse parallels Romans 8, 28 and gives us the assurance that our sufferings are not wasted. God uses them to minister to others and also to bring glory to his name. How is God glorified in our trials? By giving us the abundant grace. We need to maintain joy and strength when the going gets difficult. Whatever begins with grace leads to glory. Now, he was sure his trials were working for him, not against him. We faint not. See 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. We faint not was Paul's confident testimony. What does it matter if the outward person is perishing? so long as the inward person is experiencing daily spiritual renewal. Paul was not suggested that the body is not important or that we should ignore its warnings and needs. Since our bodies are the temple of God, we must care for them. But we cannot control the natural deterioration of human nature. When we consider all the physical trials that Paul endured, it is no wonder he wrote as he did. As Christians, we must live a day at a time. No person, no matter how wealthy or gifted, can live two days at a time. God provides for us day by day as we pray to him. He gives us the strength that we need according to our daily requirements. We must not make the mistake of trying to store up grace for future emergencies, because God gives us the grace that we need when we need it. When we learn to live a day at a time, confident of God's care, it takes a great deal of pressure off of our lives. When you live by faith in Christ, you get the right perspective on suffering. Note the contrast Paul presented in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Light affliction, weight of glory, momentary eternal 
working against us, working for us. Paul was written, was writing with eternity values in view. He was weighing the present trials against the future glory. And he discovered that his trials were actually working for him. You can see that in Romans 8 verse 18. We must not misunderstand this principle and think that a Christian can live any way he pleases and expect everything to turn into the glory in the end. Paul was writing about trials experienced in the will of God as he was doing the work of God. God can and do turn suffering into glory, but he cannot turn sin into glory. Sin must be judged because there is no glory in sin. The second Corinthians chapter 4, 16 should be related to 3, 18 because both verses have to do with the spiritual renewal of the child of God. Of itself, suffering will not make us holier men and women. Unless we yield to the Lord, turn to his word and, turn and trust him to work, our suffering could make us far worse Christians. In my own pastoral ministry, I have seen some of God's people grow critical and bitter and go from bad to worse instead of from glory to glory. We need that spirit of faith that Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 13. So Paul, he was sure the invisible world was real. Dr. A. W. Tozer used to remind us that the invisible world describes in the Bible was the only real world. If we would only see the visible world the way God wants us to see, we would never be attracted by what it offers. The great men and women of faith mentioned in Hebrews 11 achieved what they did because they saw the invisible. The things of this world seem so real because we can see them and feel them, but they are all temporal and destined to pass away. Only the eternal things of the spiritual life will last. Again, we must not press this truth into extremes and think that material and spiritual opposes each other. When we use the material in God's will, He transforms it into the spiritual, and this becomes a part of our treasure in heaven. You're going to see more on this in 2 Corinthians um, 8 and 9. We value the material because it can be used to promote the spiritual and not for what it is in itself. How can you look at things that are invisible? A good question, eh? By faith. When you read the word of God, we have never seen Christ or heaven. Yet we know they are real because the word of God tells us so. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Hebrew 11 verse 1. Because Abraham looked for the heavenly city, he separated himself from Sodom. But Lot chose Sodom because he walked by sight and not by faith. Genesis 13 and Hebrew 11 verse 10. Of course, the unsaved world thinks we are odd, perhaps even crazy. Well, sometimes I say, I'm a fool for Christ. And you know what? I like it because I love God. So perhaps even crazy. Don't let it ever bother you, okay, when people say that. Probably some people really don't understand, and we cannot blame them. So that's why we cannot go in judgment over them. Because we insist on the reality of the invisible world of spiritual blessing. Yet, 
Christians are content to govern their lives by eternal values, not temporal prizes. So my dear ones, we have a future hope. We have this ministry. We have this treasure. We have the same spirit of faith. We have a building of God. What a testimony Paul gave to the reality of the Christian faith. This building of God is not the believer's heavenly home, promised in John 14 verses 1 to 6. It is his glorified body. Paul was a tent maker. You can read that in the book of Acts 18 verses 1 to 3. And here he used a tent as a picture of our present earthly bodies. A tent is a weak, temporary structure without much beauty. But the glorified body we shall receive will be eternal, beautiful, and never shown signs of weakness or decay. See Philippians 3, the verses 20 to 21. Paul saw the human body as an earth vessel and a temporary tent, but he knew that believers would one day receive a wonderful glorified body suited to the glorious environment of heaven. It is interesting to trace Paul's testimony in these paragraphs. We know. How do we know? Because we trust the word of God. No Christian has to consult a fortune teller or a huya board or a spiritist or a deck of cards to find out what the future holds what lies on the other side of death. God has told us all that we need to know in the passages or in the pages of his word. Paul's, we know, connects with this knowing in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. And this relates to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We know that he is alive. Therefore, we know that that cannot claim us, because I live, you shall live also. If our tent is taken down, dissolved, we need not fear. We do not fear. The body is only the house we live in. When a believer dies, the body goes to the grave, but the spirit goes to be with Christ. When Jesus Christ returns for his own, he will raise the dead bodies in glory, and body and spirit shall be joined together for a glorious eternity in heaven. We groan. Paul was not expressing a morbid desire for that. In fact, his statement is just the opposite. He was eager for Jesus Christ to return so that he would be clothed upon with a glorified body. He presented three possibilities using the image of the body as a tent. First, a life residing in the tent. Second, death, unclothed out of the tent, naked. And third, clothed up on, the transformation of the body at the return of Christ. Paul was hoping that he would be alive and on the earth of the return at the return of Christ so that he might not have to go through the experience of death. Paul used a similar picture in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 to 58, and he used the idea of groaning, groaning in Romans 8, 22 to 26. The glorified body is called a building of God, a house not made with hands. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, and our house which is from heaven in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 2. This is in contrast to our mortal bodies, which came from the dust of the earth. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. It is important to note that Paul was not groaning because he was in a human body but because he longed to see Jesus Christ and receive a glorified body. He was groaning for glory. 
This explains why death holds no terrors for the Christian. Paul called this death a departure. One meaning of this Greek word is to take down one's tent and move on. But how can we be sure that we shall one day have new bodies, like the glorified bodies of our Savior? We can be sure because the Spirit lives within us. Paul mentioned the sealing and the earnest of the Spirit in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. And see also Ephesians for that, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. The Holy Spirit dwelling in the believer's body is the down payment that guarantees the future inheritance, including a glorified body. In modern Greek, the word translated earnest means engagement ring. And you know what that is. The church is engaged to Jesus Christ and is waiting for the bridegroom to come to take her to the wedding. So we are always confident. The people of God can be found in one of two places, either in heaven or on earth. None of them is in the grave, in hell, or in any intermediate place between earth and heaven. Believers on earth are at home in the body, while believers who have died are absent from the body. Believers on earth are absent from the Lord, while believers in heaven are present with the Lord. Because he had this kind of confidence, Paul was not afraid of suffering on trials or even of dangers. This is not to suggest that he tempted the Lord by taking unnecessary risks. You hear that, beautiful people? But it does mean that he was willing to lose his life for the sake of Christ and the ministry of the gospel. He walked by faith and not by sight. He looked at the eternal unseen, not the temporary seen. Heaven was not simply a destination for Paul. It was a motivation. Like the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, he looked for the heavenly city and governed his life by eternal values. As we review this section of 2 Corinthians, we can see how Paul had courage for the conflict and would not lose heart. He had a glorious ministry that transformed lives. He had a valuable treasure in the earthen vessel of his body, and he wanted to share that treasure with a bankrupt world. He had a confident faith that conquered fear, and he had a future hope that was both a destination and a motivation. No wonder Paul was more than conqueror. Every believer in Jesus Christ has these same marvelous possessions and can find through them courage for the conflict. So I will give you questions for your personal reflections or for groups discussion. First, is there something you don't have that you're tempted to focus on? If so, what is it? Another one. Read 2 Corinthians 4 and make a list of the things you do have that can keep you from losing heart. Another one. Why is the opportunity to serve God a privilege rather than a burden, even when it's painful and costly? Another one. What positive approach to ministry to see to you uh, do you see in four verses one to six why is the picture of an earthen or clay vessel an apt one for describing believers in relation to their lord another one what qualifies should we have as vessels for god's use 
Well, there's a treasure within the vessel. Another, how can God be glorified through weak vessels? When have you seen yourself as a weak vessel? Another, how did the hope of resurrection help Paul to have confidence instead of fear? You can read that in chapter 4, 13 to 18, and chapter 5, verses 1 to 6. Last one, how would focusing on what is eternal affect your daily experience? So my dear ones, that was a great encouragement. So I hope it is also for you. And you know very well that we have a life according to the life that Paul had. It's in different times. We go to suffering, trials, emotions, ups and downs, depressions, and so much more. And sometimes we lose track. And we react in a way that we really recognize ourselves that we cannot handle it. At, and why do you think we lose track? You know, sometimes we try to fix our life by our own and it's not working. I don't say that you cannot find good friends or a good therapy if you need to go there. But we have all the information in this letter that will help us to encourage us and not even our own life, but the life of other people. Blessings to all of you, my dear ones. This is your Pastor Yeni. I love you guys. Bye.